For many California taxpayers, their annual property tax bills are among the largest taxes they pay each year. In 2010-11, total revenue generated from property tax bills in California was $55 billion. Uh, and in some years, this is larger than the state's personal income tax, which is the state's largest general fund revenue source. Property taxes are collected within the county and go to support various local governments within that county, including cities, the county itself, school districts and community colleges, as well as special districts. All revenues, though, raised in a county fund local governments within that county. Californians pay property taxes on many different types of property, but most of the revenue generated, about 94% of it, comes from real property. Real property is what we generally think of as property. Land, buildings, and other structures that are built onto land, permanent structures. However, there's also another type of property in California called personal property. Personal property consists mainly of business properties, um, such as computer systems, manufacturing equipment, uh, boats and airplanes, and the like. For most local governments, property tax revenues make up the bulk of their general purpose funds. And for this reason, it's an incredibly important revenue source for them. And although the state general fund doesn't directly benefit from property tax revenue, property taxes that are distributed to schools and community colleges at the local level offset on a dollar-for-dollar -dollar basis, under most circumstances, the state's general fund spending on education. For this reason, we've put together this introductory report on California's property taxes. There are a number of different taxes and charges that are commonly found on property tax bills. The largest of those is the 1% rate, which is a statewide uniform property tax rate that applies to all real property in California. In addition to that, there are what we call voter-approved debt rates. These rates apply to real property and are used to repay bonded indebtedness that local voters approve for various infrastructure projects. These two property taxes are based on the property's taxable value, or what we call its assessed value. Property taxes like these are known as ad valorem taxes, which means according to value. The other taxes and charges found on property tax bills aren't based according to value. They're based on some other factors. These include property assessments, parcel taxes, and Melarus taxes, each of which is commonly found on property tax bills. Property assessments are usually levied in order to fund a specific benefit to a property. For example, a street lighting district, where funds are raised to maintain and construct street lighting in a particular area. Parcel taxes, on the other hand, are usually levied on an equal basis in all properties. Um, they can fund a wide variety of government services. They aren't restricted in the sense that property assessments are to a particular benefit to the property. Melarus taxes, uniquely, are often used when a property is being developed for commercial or residential purposes. In this sense, uh, a large property owner that owned a number of acres of land could designate an area with a city or a county as a Melarus district, and future residents or commercial business owners in that area would pay the Melrose taxes that would be used to finance schools, public safety, and other public services and infrastructure projects that benefit those properties. The statewide 1% rate is the largest portion of revenue generated from property tax bills. In 2010-11, it generated about $43 billion for local governments. The voter-approved debt rates, on the other hand, somewhat smaller in 2010-11, generating about $6 billion. Little statewide information is known about property assessments, Melarus taxes, and parcel taxes, and how much each of them raise individually. But we do know that the three of them combined in 2010-11 raised another $6 billion for local governments. Our report goes into more detail about how these three taxes and charges are enacted, how they're determined, and how they can be used by various local governments. Most property tax revenue in California is generated from the state's ad valorem property taxes, which is the 1% basic rate, as well as voter approved debt rates that are based on the, the assessed value of the property being taxed. Because these taxes are based on assessed value, county assessors have to determine this value each year. The mechanism for determining a property's assessed value is largely written in the state constitution and was approved by voters in 1978 with the passage of Proposition 13. As you can see in this figure, under Proposition 13, a property's assessed value is set as its acquisition value when it is sold or built. Acquisition value is generally the market value of the property, 
which is usually just the, the purchase price paid for it. Each year thereafter, its assessed value, what it's taxed at, increases by a maximum of 2%, regardless of what the property's market value does. Only when the property is again sold is it reassessed to market value at that time. This occurs here in 2002. Each year thereafter, just like before, the property's assessed value increases by a maximum of 2%. In most years, a property's assessed value is generally lower than its market value. This is because a property's assessed value can only grow at 2% each year, whereas market value can grow faster than 2% in any year. But in some cases, especially during the recent real estate decline, a property's market value may fall well below its assessed value. In 1978, voters approved Proposition 8, dealing with just this instance. Proposition 8 allows for a property's assessed value to be reduced under its Proposition 13 value should its market value fall below what its assessed value was. And this prevents a situation where a property owner is paying property taxes on an assessed value that's actually higher than the property's market value. For example, the property's market value here is well above its assessed value. In 2007 and 8, however, the property's market value declines significantly, so much so that it's well below what its assessed value under Proposition 13 would have been. This is where Proposition 8 takes effect. From 2008 through 2011, the property's assessed value actually equals its market value for those years which the market value is below what its assessed value would have been. During those years, the property's assessed value can increase or decrease by any amount and isn't governed by the 2% annual increase under Proposition 13. Once a property's market value again increases above what its Proposition 13 assessed value would have been, it's assessed just like it was originally under Proposition 13. Although most real property in California is subject to the state's property tax, there are certain exceptions to this properties that don't pay property taxes here. These properties include properties owned by governments, hospitals, religious organizations, nonprofit schools and colleges, as well as other charities. However, the property that is taxed in California can generally be assigned to one of three categories. These include owner-occupied residential property, investment and vacation residential property, and commercial property. Owner-occupied property in California are generally homes where the homeowner is, is using that property as their primary residence. Investment and vacation residential property, on the other hand, includes things like rental homes, second homes, and vacant residential land, as well as apartment complexes and timeshares, condos. These properties generally provide a, an investment asset or an income stream to the owner of the property, even though the owner doesn't live in them. The final category of property in California is commercial properties consists of manufacturing facilities, retail stores, oil and gas facilities, as well as office buildings and the like. California's tax base for the 1% rate, which applies to all properties uniformly, is, consists of these three property types. In 2010-11, there were 11 million total properties in California. 5.5 million of these were owner-occupied residences, with an assessed value of $1.6 trillion in total representing 39% of the state's assessed value. There were 4.2 million investment and vacation residential properties with assessed value of $1.4 trillion, or 34% of the state's total assessed value. And then finally, there were 1.3 million commercial properties with assessed value of $1.2 trillion, representing 28% of statewide assessed value. So the first thing to know about which local governments receive property tax revenue is that the property tax is a local government revenue source. The county collects the property tax and then distributes it to local governments throughout the county. So the property tax doesn't cross county lines, it doesn't come to the state, it stays within the county in which the tax is collected. So property taxes collected in Los Angeles County fund only local governments in Los Angeles County. Um, so now that we've established that only local governments receive property tax revenue. Which local governments receive property tax revenue in California? In fact, more than 4,000 uh, local governments throughout the state of California receive property tax from the 1% property tax rate. This includes all 58 county governments, more than 400 cities, more than 900 school districts, and 70 community college districts, as well as over 1,000 
special districts, including fire protection districts, mosquito abatement districts, park and recreation districts, and so on. Until recently, the property tax also went to redevelopment agencies. These agencies were dissolved in 2012, um, but um, their successor agencies continue to collect some property tax revenue to pay off redevelopments, ongoing debts, and obligations. As you can see in this figure, schools and community colleges collect the most property tax statewide, followed by counties and then cities. This is just a statewide distribution, however. Um, if you look at, at individual communities or localities, the distribution could vary considerably. For example, although statewide county governments receive roughly 25% of property tax revenue, Orange County only receives 11% of the countywide property tax revenue, and Alpine County receives almost 65% of the revenue collected in the county. It's also important to note that even though the property tax is a local revenue source, it does affect the state budget, and this is because of the state's education finance system. Under the state's education finance system, schools receive operating funds from both local property tax revenue and from state aid. They're guaranteed a minimum level of funding, so if property tax revenue increases, the amount of state aid that has to go to schools decreases. So the state, as well as local governments, um, have a significant fiscal interest in the amount of property tax going to schools, because the more property tax revenue going to schools, the less the state has to, to spend um, on, on education. There is considerable variation in the amount of property tax that each type of local government collects throughout California. For example, the average city in California collects about $240 per resident in property tax revenue from the 1% rate. But some cities collect more than $500 in property tax per resident, while other cities collect less than $150 per resident. Or consider that in San Mateo County, school districts on average collect more than $5,000 in property tax revenue per student, while in Fresno County, schools on average collect less than $1,000 in property tax revenue per student. So why does this happen? Why do some school districts in parts of the state receive more in property tax revenue than others? Why do some county governments receive more in property tax revenue than others? There are a few major reasons for this variation. First, property taxes are based on assessed values, and property values throughout the state vary significantly. For example, um, local governments in highly populated areas with a lot of commercial and residential development with a lot of density will collect more in property taxes than say rural or, or less populated areas because the property values there are higher and there's more development. Coastal areas or resort areas tend to have higher property values than more rural areas or inland areas like the Central Valley and so those areas will collect more in property taxes than others. And so due to the state's geographic variations and the variation in property values throughout the state, the local governments collect different amounts of property taxes. Another reason for the variation is local government's use of redevelopment. Until recently, cities and counties could declare an area blighted and make that area into a redevelopment project area. Once an area became a redevelopment project area, most of the growth in property taxes would go to the redevelopment agency rather than to the other local governments that serve that property. And so school districts or cities or counties that have redevelopment areas near them would receive less in property tax revenue than they otherwise would. In some areas of the state, such as San Bernardino and Riverside County, redevelopment agencies receive more than 20 percent of the property tax revenue. And so in these areas, school districts or, or maybe the city or county will receive less in property tax revenue than comparable local governments that don't have redevelopment nearby. A third reason for the, the variation in property tax revenue receipts by, by different types of local governments is the state's property tax allocation laws. Prior to 1978, each local government would set its own property tax rate. So every year, for example, the school district would determine how much revenue it would need for that year and set a property tax rate at a level it would need to collect that amount of revenue. Then, the property owner's tax bill would just be the sum of all the local government's different property tax rates. Under this system, the average property tax rate in, in the mid-70s was about 2.7%. Then, in 1978, voters passed Proposition 13, which capped the local property tax rate at 1% and assigned the state the responsibility of allocating 
property tax revenue among all the local governments in, this, in the state. Faced with this challenge of distributing a now smaller pot of revenue, of property tax revenue, among the unique combinations of local governments in each of California's 58 counties, the state implemented a system known as AB8, named after um, the, the bill, Assembly Bill 8, that put the system into place. AB8 was kind of a, a treat you as you were system in which the, the property tax from the now 1% rate would be allocated according to or in proportion to the amount of property tax revenue that each local government received in the county in the mid-1970s. So for example, if a local government had a relatively high property tax rate in the mid-1970s, it would receive a relatively high share of the property taxes under the 1% rate after 1978. Although there have been some changes to the AB8 system since, since its inception, a lot of the way the property tax is distributed throughout the state is still based on that mid-1970s preferences and tax rates. So for example, you know, a city that maybe levied a, a, a high property tax rate in the mid-1970s, most likely because it provided a lot of, a lot of services, would likely continue to, continue to receive a high, a high share of the property tax today. Meanwhile, a city that had a relatively low property tax rate in the mid-1970s, maybe it relied on the county or the special, dis or special districts to provide services, or maybe it wasn't even incorporated yet in 1978, most likely receives a small share of property taxes today. Um, so to summarize, some of the major reasons that, that some local governments receive more property taxes than others is first, property values throughout the state very significantly. Um, second, the use of redevelopment can divert property taxes from local governments to redevelopment agencies or now to their successor agencies. And lastly, the state's allocation laws have to a certain extent locked in um, property tax preferences um, and shares from, from kind of the, the mid-1970s. Over the years, a number of concerns have been raised about how property tax from the 1% rate is allocated in California. One of the, the major concerns is that the system was largely designed in the late 1970s and isn't necessarily responsive to modern needs and preferences. For example, the, the system under Assembly Bill 8 largely locked into place um, the, the preferences of, of local communities in the 1970s, and it hasn't re been necessarily responsive to changes in the state over the last 30 years. For example, in the 1970s, some portions of the state were very sparsely populated, but have since grown tremendously, but the property tax distribution has not always changed to reflect that growth in population. Another concern is that the property tax is control the, the allocation of the property tax is controlled by state laws, even though it is a local government revenue source. And so local residents and local officials really have no authority to change the distribution of the property tax. If residents or officials in Orange County prefer that a larger share of property tax revenue went to the county, say, rather than, than special districts, they themselves could not make that change. It would require a change in state law. And so kind of this, this link between the, the level of government that distributes the tax or, or spends the tax revenue and the level of government that decides who gets the tax revenue, the state, has, has, been, has been severed. Um, another, another concern with, with the distribution of, the, of property tax revenue in California is that it has kind of reduced government accountability and also transparency. And, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, once again, since, since a local government doesn't necessarily determine how much tax revenue it receives, that's done through state law, it's hard to hold that government entity or the elected officials accountable if you're unhappy with the level of service you're receiving, because they can always fall back on there's, you know, saying there's nothing we can do about that, that that's the amount of property tax revenue we, we, we receive under, under state law. It also makes it difficult for the, pro for the taxpayer to know exactly where their property tax revenues are going. On the tax bill, it simply says 1% general tax rate and doesn't denote all the various local governments, school districts, special districts, city and county that the tax revenue goes to or how much each government receives. And so the, the taxpayer has a hard time due to the complex nature of the allocation laws of following exactly how much of their money is going to each different local government. 
Um, now, although many of these problems have been widely recognized over the years, reforming or changing the system is very difficult. Um, just one, one reason would be over 4,000 local governments in California receive the property tax. So change in the allocation system would involve a number of stakeholders and interests. Additionally, providing property tax to providing more property tax to one local government would therefore mean taking property tax away from another local government. Um, and, and deciding who wins and who loses is a very difficult task. Um, and lastly, a lot of the property tax allocation rules and laws have, have been set into the Constitution, and so any major reform or change would require going back to the voters to change the allocation laws and the rules regarding, regarding the property tax. Economists often use objective tax policy criteria to evaluate different taxes. In this report, we chose five common criteria and applied them to the state's property tax. These criteria include how quickly the revenue grows from year to year, how stable it is from one year to the next, how simple it is for taxpayers to comply with and for the government to administer and collect, and whether or not it treats taxpayer decisions neutrally or does it alter them. And finally, does a property tax treat California property owners equitably? Since 1979, property tax revenue has grown at an annual rate somewhat faster than the state's economy, meaning that by the growth standard, it performs relatively well, able to fund the local public services that it was designed to. In addition, it's also a relatively stable tax from one year to the next. In fact, the personal income tax, the state's largest general fund revenue source, has been three times more volatile than the state's property tax since 1979. Also, the property tax is a relatively simple tax to administer for government and to comply with on the taxpayer side. Assessed value is, in most instances, determined by simply increasing the prior year's assessed value by 2% of the rate of inflation. And property taxes are doing two equal installments each year. For these three criteria, growth, stability, and simplicity, the state's property tax generally performs well compared to other revenue sources. Economists generally prefer taxes that are economically neutral. That is, taxes that don't affect taxpayer decisions about what to buy, how much to save, or where to work or live. The property tax, however, may influence certain taxpayer decisions. For example, homeowners and businesses may choose to move less frequently under California's property tax than they would otherwise. This is because as a homeowner or a business continues to live or work in the same, same property over a number of years, it's likely that their assessed value is significantly lower than their market value. If they were to move then, their assessed value would be reset to market value, meaning they could see a significant increase in their annual property taxes. Economists also prefer equitable taxes. Under an equitable tax, similar taxpayers, that is, those with like incomes or wealth, or that own similar types of property, would pay the same amount in taxes. California's property tax system, however, may not in all circumstances meet this standard of equity. For example, if a new homeowner moves into a neighborhood and purchases a home, their assessed value is going to be equal in that year to what they paid for the home, its market value. The next door neighbor, however, could have the same property and have lived there for a number of decades. In that case, their assessed value is likely to be far, far below their market value. In this case, the two property owners would pay vastly different property taxes, even though they're living in essentially identical properties. Our review of California's property tax system, according to common economic principles, found mixed results. On the one hand, the property tax provides local governments with a growing source of relatively stable revenue. It's also relatively simple for taxpayers to comply with and for the governments to administer. However, the property tax may, in some instances, alter certain taxpayer decisions, for example, about how often to move or when to relocate. And in addition, the property tax may not always treat similar taxpayers similarly. The property tax in California, like all revenue sources, is best viewed in conjunction to the entire state-local fiscal relationship. All revenue sources involve trade-offs. The property tax, of course, is no exception. <laughs>